sort of the interface between uh, human and red deer, um, looking at sort of the, trying to quantify the impacts of outdoor recreation activity on the spatial distribution of red deer. Um, and before I get too far into the talk, I think uh, I try and do my acknowledgements at the beginning of my talks to, to let people know who I'm working with and, wh and what, what sort of uh, components different people have in the project. So this project um, is joint between a, a number of people and really the person who has probably been most instrumental in getting the project going is uh, Justin Irvine who is, was originally at the James Hutton Institute but has now moved to a uh, conservation group in Africa. So if you know Justin, you, know, you might know he's no longer around. We're also working with other researchers at James Hutton. Um, Dr. Phil Stevens at Durham, who is also going to feature, I think, in the next uh, talk as well. Uh, an MSc student at Durham who's currently working on some of the data analysis, and some students at St. Andrews who are at various stages in their participation in this project. And we've been supported by uh, a number of groups uh, thus far. And so the main goal of this project is to take a look at, um, to try and quantify the impact that outdoor recreation has on the spatial red distribution of red deer. Um, and this is challenging because, well, first of all, because humans are involved. Um, so that actually makes problems often more complex than we think. And it's also challenging because the, the distribution or the, the spatial distribution of red deer is uh, impacted by a number of things. So it's not only impacted by outdoor recreation activity, of course. So we need to also try and take into consideration the other things that are also influencing the spatial distribution. Um, and that's, this is kind of where we are right now, is we're trying to develop the project. This project is really in its infancy, and we're trying to develop this component of the project so that going forward we can try and look at testing some things that might help us under, to improve maybe the impact or try and mitigate the impact that outdoor recreation might have. Um, and so where we're doing this at the moment is at North Chesil Estate. Um, if you know where this is, then you don't need the map, but if you're not aware of it, it's located there. There's a satellite imagery and it. it's an interesting case study because it's a fairly accessible and popular hill walking area. Uh, not in the least because there's four accessible Monroes in a single loop. And so if you are able to drive there, you can access it from Edinburgh and Glasgow within a day. So within a day trip, you can get up there, park, walk the loop, and catch four Monroes. So I think that's an attractive, and it's very picturesque, of course, so it's an attractive place for outdoor recreation activity, as I'm sure many, many of the states are. And so we've developed a system to try and collect data on what hill walkers are doing and see when and where they're seeing wildlife, essentially. And so last, no last summer we did a pilot project where we had an uh, undergraduate student sit up. His name was Oliver. He sat at the, at the trailhead. He passed out GPS devices. So these GPS devices are not much, they're roughly the size of this. Uh, thing that I'm holding. They have almost no buttons. The hill walkers don't have to do anything. They just basically stick it in their pocket. So we gave them a GPS that they would carry while they were hill walking. Then when they got back to the end of the trail, so it's nice because it was a loop, when they got back they would stick it in a, in a box basically. And so we did that for 25 sampling days last summer spread across both weekdays and weekend days. And basically, at, at this site, it, it made sense to pass out the GPSs in the morning, then we could do other things in the afternoon, um, and they would stick their completed uh, GPS uh, thing in the box. At the same time, we also gave them a cue card, a little piece of cardboard, and asked them to fill out a wildlife viewing survey. And so all we asked them to do was say, okay, what wildlife did you see? What time did you see it? and then provide us information on the bearing and distance at which you saw that wildlife. And we didn't actually focus on red deer, we called it a wildlife viewing survey, but we're really interested in, in looking at these interactions or these viewings and these sightings of, of, of red deer. And so, very simple. So we'd give them a little like golf pencil and one of these cue cards and they would fill that out as they were hill walking. And because we asked them to record the time, we could then link that directly to the GPS data, and I'll show you how we did that in a second. And so uh, this is sort of our preliminary finding was that um, 
121 groups were asked to participate on those uh, days. So a group would be, if, if you came in a group of four, we would only give you one GPS, for example. So we asked 121 groups to participate and 116 agreed, which in sort of our area of research is an incredibly high success rate. This was way higher than we would have expected. Um, and nobody stole our GPSs. <laughs> so double success here. So we had high, high participation and no one stole anything. So in considering we are dealing with humans, this is pretty, uh, pretty remarkable. Um, so that was great. But what this allows us to do then is map where people are going across, uh, across the estate, but also looking sort of relative to the trail, because that's what we're really interested in, is where are people going relative to the trail. And so this is, this is a, a great map, and you can see lots of people uh, following the trail, and there's some key areas where people maybe move off the trail, and there are also different areas where people cut the trail short. Um, and there's people who are heroes that like, are trying to show off, I think, because we gave them a GPS and <laughs> essentially walked or ran. I'm not sure if this was like a, someone training for some sort of uh, a marathon or something, but that's something like uh, about 40 kilometer loop, I think. <laughs> so I'm not sure. There might have been some driving or biking involved there as well. But anyways, back, back to this. So this, this is just raw data. This is just GPS tracks. And it's not really meaningful in and above that it's a map of where people go. So at the moment, we're trying to come up with ways to synthesize that into more meaningful outputs. And so one thing we can do is look at the intensity of use. And so if you compare that with just the raw data, we can start to pick out some key areas at this uh, site where people are sort of spending more time. So for example, at some of the key Monroe peaks, there are hot spots that just represent there's more GPS points there, which means people probably stop there. We can also see sort of the, the trail is a, an obvious hot spot. We can also start to pick out places where they are more often going off the trail. So that can be infor uh, important information when we're trying to design sort of interventions that, for example, signage or other things that we might want to do at this site in the future. Um, and one of the things that uh, we, fo we found interesting initially is that where people get sort of maybe lost, they're not necessarily lost, but where they go off trail and they're not really lost, they're just the trail isn't clear. Um, and so there are some areas that in this one in particular, where people didn't really seem to be following the trail, but they ended up back where they were supposed to go most of the time anyways. So, the, so what is a trail in, the, in this case is kind of interesting to, to think about. Um, and the wildlife uh, viewing surveys, we had lots of enthusiasm, you would say. So for example, things as dragonflies, all sorts of different, um, different types of wildlife. They're good at filling out their time. Sometimes they gave us a bearing and distance. Sometimes they didn't. They gave us notes ab <laughs> about numbers. And lots of people just find this kind of stuff interesting. And so this person, for example, gave us their email address to send them sort of some results when we were done with the study. Interested to hear any results, send us an email. So that's neat, um, neat as well. So out of the 116 or so people that we gave these to, 83 provided us with a, a card that was usable. We have over 300 records of uh, wildlife sightings, 102 with useful information on bearing and distance, and we had about only about 42 of red deer. So not huge numbers in terms of this kind of project, but some interesting things to start from. Um, but what this allows us to do is to map where people are seeing red deer on the trail and where the red deer are if they provide us that bearing of distance and look at lines of sight and potential interactions between them. And so this is just sort of preliminary data and, and we're still not sure exactly what we're going to do with this. But we can start to see where hillwalkers are seeing red deer on this site, where there might be the biggest potential for interactions with red deer, so maybe where the biggest potential for disturbance is, and maybe areas where there's less potential for disturbance. And we all can also see where people are seeing them when they're off the trail, and that might be even more problematic because that's the sort of harder thing to manage is when people are off the trail. 
We can look at sort of differences between time of day, and this is just some preliminary results looking at distance. So one of the things we were interested in are people seeing uh, red deer closer to the trail in the morning versus the afternoon. Um, we didn't find any real differences there. There was a difference in bearing, but um, that might be more related to just the shape of the study area than anything. So that may not be of any value in terms of actual management. But this is interesting as a, a starting point. At the same time, so we passed out these GPSs to hill walkers and we were doing this wildlife viewing survey and at the same time we set up a camera trap system throughout the estate. Um, so last summer what we used were 11 transects of camera traps. Where the, uh, at each transect we placed three camera traps and we basically looked at different distances away from the trail. So cameras were placed at 25, 75 and 150 meters from the trail and we alternated the cameras over the summer across both sides of the trail. And we experimented with photos that are taken based on sensors, but then also photos taken at a regular time interval. And basically, we're looking at trying to test how deer avoid the trail or the area around the trail, if this happens at different times of the day um, or different locations across the study site. And so these these transects were located at sort of three different zones within the site and these are kind of interesting for different reasons. Um, we see the trail is, is this sort of loop and people are uh, asked to walk the loop in a clockwise fashion because uh, it's believed that that minimizes disturbance on the deer but there's not necessarily a lot of evidence to suggest that. So hopefully by looking at sort of the main part of the trail where they would be in the morning and then in the afternoon, we can start to look at whether there are differences in deer closer or further away from the trail at those times. Also then onto sort of the, at the, uh, along the ridge, along the sort of back end of the estate, are, are there locations where deer are avoiding or using the area near the trail at that location as well. So that, that was the setup we used. Whoop. And this is sort of the ongoing analysis that I was talking to. So the MSc student from Durham is currently working his way through all these photos. So about 15,000 photos were captured, about 4,000 contained red deer, about 30% 30, 30 of these were on days when we have hillwalkers present. And we're processing these images for a whole bunch of pieces of information. So we can look at the timing. So we know obviously we know where the camera was. We know the timing, so we know when it was taken. We can then take the content of the image and do different things. So we can look at the deer, we can look at the sort of demographics of the deer in those photos, we can look at whether sheep are present, we can extract things like weather conditions, and we can also try and quantify things about the behavior of the deer when those photos are taken. And we can relate that back to our GPS data because we know when people were also on the hill. So we can then relate whether photos are being taken when we know people are on the hill or not as well. So we have that information and that's what we're working on linking at the moment. So it's early days for our project um, and so our key findings are pretty simplistic to say the least. But I think one of the things that we found most useful was that this GPS tracking idea was relatively successful in that people were willing to participate. Um, and participate at a level that was much higher than I would have even expected, having done different types of GPS tracking studies in the past. Um, the wildlife survey that we used, the cue cards, I would say we had sort of mixed success. I think the data is really interesting, but it's maybe not of the vo uh, volume that we would need to do some sort of more robust analysis. And one of the great questions about this kind of data because we're just asking people, just regular people who are hill walking, to collect this sort of pretty fine data about where they see deer and, and what t those things are. So we don't know how reliable it is. So one of the things we're going to try and do this summer is come up with ways to try and estimate the reliability of that data. So by having people from our team in the field at the same time when people are doing the GPS tracking and trying to figure out if they're actually seeing deer when they should be or not. And I think by mapping where these uh, interactions occur, we can start to come up with data that allows us to ask questions about how we might 
manage access and hill walking in this area. And of course, one of the great things is we can just map where hill walkers are going. Um, and that allows us to look at ways we might improve sort of management tactics associated with um, outdoor access in relation to conserving wildlife. So I think that's um, very useful. So this is kind of uh, preliminary results and so it's also maybe of interest for me to identify where we're trying to go with this um, in sort of some key areas. And I'd also welcome feedback or, or comments uh, from, from the group as well if people have seen things or, or, or have thought about things that maybe we haven't. Um, so what we're going to plan to do this summer is to continue what we've done in the previous summer. Um, but we're going to try and focus the, the wildlife viewing survey on red deer because that's what we're really interested in. And we're not really interested in where people are seeing things like butterflies. Um, and one of the things we really want to do is look at uh, ways to test the reliability of asking people to tell us where they're seeing animals. And so that's this whole citizen science idea. And so having uh, people from our team in the hill while the hill walkers have GPSs and then using sort of vantage and trans transit counts to identify where the deer are at those times. We've also, we're also planning to modify our camera trap arrangement uh, in some ways. We're going to continue doing some of those transects that we did last year, but we're also going to start to do a stratified uh, sampling scheme across different vegetation types to try and account for the habitat that's further away from the trail and the sort of diversity of vegetation that's within the site. <laughs> and one of the things I think we're interested in is looking at how the role of sheep in terms of uh, the deer distribution. So using the camera traps to sort of test ideas of where, where and when sheep and deer are interacting with each other, so when they're together, and when sheep and deer are not together, and what that relates to in terms of the hill walking activity on the site. Uh, and this is one of the things I've been kind of working on as well. Um, the paper-based survey that we're doing is kind of old-fashioned, you might say. And so one of the things I'd like to do is try and involve uh, mobile phone technology. And so I had some students in an MSc computer science course that one of my colleagues, friends, teaches. And it's a, it's a course on visual design. So they designed what an app might look like uh, to help us collect this wildlife interaction data. And one of the students is going to try and build this app for her dissertation in the summer. And so the app would be a mobile phone app and it'll hopefully be tied to the camera on your phone. So say you see deer, you would take a photo of the deer on your camera, then you would say, I saw some deer. I would say quickly how many I saw. I would point my phone at the deer and it would record the bearing and then I would have to estimate the distance because distance is not something your phone can just do for you. Um, and so whether we can design an app that does that effectively is not clear, but it, it, the idea would be to then try and automate and scale this whole wildlife viewing survey in some way. The other thing I'm really interested in looking at is trying to come up with new and big data sets that might help us understand where <coughs> outdoor recreation activity is occurring to anticipate where maybe impacts on wildlife would be highest. And one of the most interesting data sets in this round is from Strava. Do people know what Strava is? Yeah. So Strava is global fitness tracking data. They recently re released this heat map, which you can go and view online. It's just like Google Maps, but it's got fitness tracking data overlaid on it. It was highly controversial when it was released because people in the US military were using it for all sorts of things and it was then being uploaded onto their server and then you could find where military guys and girls were essentially exercising around bases across the world, which were in theory hidden, but were not. Um, and so if you, if you have an estate or if you are interested in an area, you can go on this uh, website and look at sort of the heat map of data, of fitness tracking data on your site. And when we look at this data and compare it to our data that we collected, we see a very striking similarity in terms of the, the patterns. 
And so one of the things I'm looking to do is trying to get this data so we can get this data from this company and then use it to build sort of larger, broader scale maps of recreational intensity. And then we can compare that geographically with some of the, the maps we have on things like deer distribution, but really all sorts of different wildlife. So trying to find that link between um, where people are going and, and where wildlife are, where might the conflicts be the highest. So that's an interesting idea as well. And this is sort of our highest level target is to one day do uh, GPS collaring of the red deer. And so this is a project I'm collaborating on with people in the United States, not looking at hill uh, hiking or hill walking, but here we're looking at uh, hunters. So we actually have the hunters in this area carrying a GPS device while they're hunting. And, and you all know that the hunting, uh, the way hunting works in North America is very different than the way hunting works over here. Um, so there's lots of interesting spatial questions about the response of wildlife to hunters on the landscape during hunting season and not during hunting season. And so by GPS tracking both the animals, so in this case white-tailed deer and the hunters at the same time, we can identify sort of behavioral responses associated with interaction events between the two. Um, and so the idea would be to l try and do the same thing here in Scotland where we have GPS colors on a, on a sample of deer and we're then implementing the GPS tracking stuff that we're doing already simultaneously. And from that you can start to get a finer scale uh, picture of what the response is to human presence. So that's it for me. Um, I'm happy to take questions and comments. Um, we're still kind of in our early stages, collecting data as much as we can. Uh, analysis is yet to come in more detail. Thanks. Thank you, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs>